in all other countries they try and exclude this expenditure from the defense budget in our case we have deliberately added it to show that we are spending one hell of a lot on defense let's not forget it is a nuclear armed power take a look at pakistan that economy is in meltdown yet the defense budget of pakistan has gone up by 15% over the previous year pakistan is a bloody nuisance i'm afraid it may look very grand in terms of lacks of crores uh, but a reality check is very simple we have a vibrant private sector why should the hal only do the manufacture of the tejas aircraft the finance minister mrs nirmala sita raman has presented the annual budget before the parliament and today the newspapers are full of analytics on the budget what it has for the common man what it has for the middle class and uh, the very significant steps that are being taken to give a fillip to employment generation various new schemes new fangled ideas are being uh, have been enunciated and will be tried out uh, we veterans however were quite obviously looking at the defense budget and we were hoping that in the light of the major significant rise in the threat profile external challenges as well as internal stressors we were we were really looking forward to a meaningful increase in the defense budget to cater for the very challenging environment that we are today confronted with i'm afraid i must be straight forward and blunt up front we been disappointed the defense budget at 6.21 lakh crores this is just about an increase of in percentage percentile terms of 4.72% less than 5% increase this is hardly adequate to even cater for annual inflation in prices and costs we have hardly catered for the inflation that means we are exactly where we were last year and earlier take a look at pakistan that economy is in meltdown that country is facing a economic collapse yet the defense budget of pakistan now presented has gone up by 15% over the previous year they are your threat to say we are too big we will ignore pakistan is good but in actual fact pakistan is a bloody nuisance let's not forget it is a nuclear armed power and china has made it its cat's paw to keep india badly tied down in south asia so that the chinese intention is that the troops that were pulled out from jnk and sent to ladakh and elsewhere you know we are forced to get them back so there is a uh, enhancement in our threat profile and that necessitated that we put in more bang for the buck the in percentile terms of the gdp our defense budget is supposed to be 1.9% of the gdp may i point out in all humility that it includes the pay and emoluments of the armed forces the civilian establishment that we have in the ministry of defense it includes the major pension bill of the armed forces including the defense civilians in all other countries they try and exclude this expenditure from the defense budget they because they do not want to inflate the defense budget because that raises concerns in the neighborhood in our case we have deliberately added it to show that we are spending one hell of a lot on defense i'm afraid it may look very grand 
it may look very huge when we talk in terms of lakhs of crores, uh, but a reality check will is very simple. What exactly is China spending on its defense budget? China's defense budget today is two hundred and ninety-six billion dollars. To India's defense budget of eighty-four billion dollars. Eighty-four billion dollars. We haven't even touched eighty-five in this new budget. Catered, add to that. the pakistani defense budget of 8.5 billion dollars add that to the chinese budget and by the way the chinese budget instead of you know expanding it hides hell of a lot it hides the expenditure on the people's armed police which are lot of the chinese formations that you know they were uh, we were told were being cut down were simply given a change of uniform and made into the people's armed police not one of those boys has gone anywhere and we in our country there are a lot of people who said we must follow suit china has cut its armed forces by such huge numbers yes they cut them they just made them into the people's armed police into the paramilitary forces and there is a hell of a lot of other expenditure that is not really reflected in their official defense budget there was one american source which uh, had estimated that if you cater for the you know uh, ppp you know the parity prices uh, compared to the dollar spendings and the chinese renminbi spendings yuan spendings the chinese budget is almost worth about 700 billion dollars let's just go by the official figures of 296 which i said if you add these uh, other uh, heads which are hidden a lot of research and development head is paid uh, from the defense budget but it is hidden it's not mentioned as such there's a lot of civil military fusion kind of a thing that they are doing it is almost 300 billion dollars plus so at 84 billion dollars you are about one third to about between one third to one fourth of the chinese defense expenditure fortunately for us china also has to cater for the united states japan philippines taiwan south korea etc so to that extent we are lucky but we are still badly woefully short and we have to now make up donald trump insisted that all the european countries of europe of nato must increase their defense budget to minimum 2% of the gdp the russians have had to increase their defense budget to 8% of the gdp because of the ongoing conflict taiwan which is threatened is spending 3% of its gdp on defense all european countries whose threat profile is far lower than ours you know they have america to bank upon are spending 2% of their gdp on defense our actual expenditure is down to 1.5% of the gdp on defense you know uh, there was that revenue exercise carried out a couple of years back and they decided that the defense budget will be about this much do the finance ministry have have are they cognizant of the threat profile of the operational challenges can they just as a fiat lay it down to help with your uh, assessments we will give you this much i i i i i think that would be not very prudent not very prudent and we have been carrying on with these low defense budgets for a long time now the good cheerful one factor redeeming factor is that we are now <coughs> doing a major amount for uh, self uh, uh, reliance for autarky in weapon systems we are trying to now you know spend buy more locally actually the indian navy had led this process 
the Indian Navy had led this process and they had, you know, started building a Navy. They are today building a Navy, not buying a Navy. Most of the bulk of our battleships, you know, we are building our own aircraft carriers, our own nuclear submarines, our own conventional submarines, our, our destroyers, our frigates, our minesweepers, etc. They are all being built within the country in India. I do think the Indian Navy set the lead just after independence. They had opened a ship design bureau in the IIT Delhi. That's the way to go. And now, uh, under a fair amount of governmental pressure, the Army and the Air Force have also followed suit. And Atma Nirbharta is the way to go. We have, you know, the in the allocation for the defense budget, the capital budget now is 27.6%. The revenue expenditure is 14.8% on operational preparedness, etc. Pay and allowances are 30.68%. Defense pensions are 22.7%. And that is the rationale for the Agni Veer scheme. So I am happy that people are trying to economize. And their focus primarily is on defense. How to chop and cut and pare down, reduce, downsize in the defense. I am afraid they must equally, the government has to be cognizant of the operational aspects of whatever cost cutting measures we are undertaking. How do they affect the operational efficiency of the armed forces? I am afraid right now, uh, that seems to be a very low priority area, an uh, area of very low concern as to operational, uh, you know, efficiency. I'm equally sorry to state, we see a tendency for turf wars. You know, we are told that a lot of the Agni Vs, they would be absorbed in the CPOs. They have resisted a tooth, nail and claw. They said they want to do their own. And it's only now under governmental pressure that about 10 percent they are saying they will, the CISF and the others, that they will take the Agni Veers who retire within, I think, about a year or so. The first batch will start going back to the CV street. But the fact of the matter is that we already had a 10 percent reservation for ex servicemen who retire. They were to be absorbed in the CPOs. This, we haven't seen that quota being fulfilled. So I'm not very sure. We'll wait and watch what happens as to this 10% additional that is being talked of. The most rational element was, like the Chinese have done, they just converted units that were surplus, they converted them into PAP, People's Armed Police. And previously also, a lot of army officers, etc., the, the core colonel was laid by army officers who had been seconded to the border security force, etc., to the CRPF very early on, in the early phase of independence in those years. So uh, it would be a very rational uh, decision at the apex level that boys who retire, boys, Agni Veers who are being made to retire very young, very youthful, they are all absorbed into the CPOs. Look, it's all very well to say that they are very patriotic, you know, they have learned discipline and they will not go astray if they are let loose on the CV street. Kindly be realistic. We have seen ex-servicemen being misled by the terrorists in Punjab. General, Major General Shabek Singh was leading the terrorists in the Golden Temple and there were a hell of a lot of ex-servicemen who were there, who had been misled, misguided by the Khalistani terrorists into fighting, waging war against the state. We have the Maoists today. We have uh, the, the Khalistani terrorists again raising their heads. We have the terrorist movement in Punjab, in JNK itself. We have insurgencies in Nagaland and Manipur, still not quelled. There is a lot of unrest there, etc. 
it would have been most logical if these well trained people combat experience boys who had served in the rr boys who have served in kargil ladakh etc well trained in uh, military skills if they are seconded to the central police organizations it would benefit the country as a whole it would be speak a whole of the government approach a national approach to these problems and not segmented silos and turf wars of each you know each segmented organization cisf bsf crpf itbp covering its own turf on the one hand we are we are told that manpower is a massive drain on resources then why are we increasing the uh, uh, why are seven itbp battalions being raised the simple answer we are told is because they are required i am afraid the ci grid in rajauri and punch and riasi and katwa and doda and kishtwad is also required why is that uh, you know uh, uh, ruthlessly being cut as the only wastage that is apparent you are increasing manpower in the cpos at the same time that you are paring down manpower in the armed forces on the basis of uh, you know on on the basis of that they are a waste or a drain on our budgetary resources you know i would humbly like to remind you of one historical fact nehru a first prime minister of independent india when the british army british chief of the indian army after independence general sir roy butcher he went to his new boss and he saluted and he wanted to present to him plans for modernization and expansion of the indian armed forces the indian army nehru was aghast he told him general i don't need an army i only need the police i hope and pray in the lighter way that we are not heading for that denouement which pandit nehru had wished for that was tragic and those were famous last words because he said no country in its right mind would attack peaceful non aligned ahinsa wadi india china did and taught us a bitter lesson we had to raise 10 mountain divisions additional in the wake of the uh, chinese offensive surprise attack and thereafter after 65 we again had to expand the armed forces after 71 we again had to expand the armed forces because there were operational pressing needs there is a very very dangerous tendency to somehow ignore play down downplay operational exigencies operational efficiency as a very very uh, very very critical factor when we decide force levels equipment levels manpower levels etc the budget needs to be enhanced the budget must be enhanced quickly we the russia ukraine war says we need medium artillery when i was in the military operations directorate in the year 1999 prior to that we were working on a plan to mediumize the indian artillery at the 155 mm caliber level the bofors level right it's still not been done whereas medium artillery has proved to be a war winning factor you can't spread this out ki we will do 10 a year and possibly in the next 10 20 years we'll give you what you need if your problems are in the here and now you will have to commit additional resources to see that you are ready in time the major conflicts with china pakistan that have to come will come within the next few years right it would hardly be any point you know after our wars are done and over with then trying to give the armed forces 
uh, their wherewithal that they need to prevail. There are no prizes for runners up in war. The Tejas program, we were so happy that it would finally help us to phase out the legacy MiG 21s. 23, MiG 23, 27 have already gone. That legacy fighter squadron had to be phased out. A squadron strength should be 42. Actually, it should be 45 squadrons, but 42 is the government given level to face a two front scenario. And that is down to 30 squadrons. Some people are saying even less. And now we find that the engines that the Americans were supposed to give us, the, the G404, G414, are just not forthcoming. It's been a 10 months delay. Kaveri engine is still a pie in the sky. So we need to pump in more resources to cater for the threats in the here and now. Leisurely programs of, you know, the Tejas pace of induction has been very, very slow. We have a vibrant private sector. Why should the HAL only do the manufacture of the Tejas aircraft? Give it out to some other private companies. Double the rate of induction, but that means you have to double the resource allocation. It's about time that we do it ourselves before we are forced by circumstances. Jai Bharat, Jai Hind. Please like and support the Chanakya Dialogues and on target. Thank you.